Thank you, worship team. Thank you, job as, as always to give us the time of praise and worship is good for us. Psalmist says that it's good for us to praise the Lord. It's good for the upright, for the righteous to praise his name. And so, Father, I pray that our worship today has been focused on you. And now as we come to the word as well, may you use it to teach, to lead us, to direct us this morning in the ways that you desire to see our lives transformed. We need your help. I need your help. Because we want you this morning to come forth into our midst, to bring forth the living word into our lives. The word is God breathed. And so as we enter it today, as we open it and read it, Father, breathe into us the life that we need to be transformed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we are continuing into our messages dealing with uh, transformation. We've been out the last couple weeks. Uh, the weather that's been kind of up and down. Um, you can catch messages on our on our. Uh, our website, now we have a Facebook page that will have a link to it as well, so you can always catch messages from previous weeks. Last week we began to look at changing habits and, and looking at the spiritual foundation. The importance that it doesn't matter how many conferences or books you read, self-help books or whatever you want, nothing is more important than being spiritually healthy. And we talked about the significance that that is the key foundation. If you want to be healthy mentally, if you want to be healthy, healthy uh, emotionally, physically, financially, vocationally, it doesn't matter what area of your life, if you want to be healthy, it begins by being spiritually healthy. If we're not there, then nothing else will come into to place with this. And so last week, we, we looked at this picture of Luke chapter 15 and how the son took what the father gave and went into the far land, squandered it, and then found himself looking at what he was feeding the pigs and said, that looks so good. And we talked about how we are made for so much more than to live eating what the pigs are. And so when we come to that point to realize, spiritually, we have to come to the point where we are disgusted with where we're at, come to our senses, and come back. And so we talked about the significance of, of the spiritual aspect of being reborn, not just making a new leaf, but having a new life and, and what that meant. And so uh, that was the foundation. And so we're going to just start building upon this foundation each week, looking at areas of our life. This morning, we're going to look at the mind. We're going to look at mental, uh, mentally uh, transformed. And, and the idea here is simply that, you know, right living requires right thinking. We're going to talk about the, the thinking and, and the thoughts about the mind. And, and, and I'm, I'm not a, a uh, licensed uh, a psychiatrist. Is that, is that probably what it is? I, you know, I, I don't know anything about that stuff. All I, all I can do is approach it from the sense of, of what the Word tells me. And then I believe the Holy Spirit will help you do the rest. But we're going to look at the sense of the mind this morning. We're going to look at what, what the scripture says about the mind and, and, and this battle that wages war against it. And so if you want to open with me to Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin there. We're going to look at a lot of scripture today, so please bear with me as we uh, go through this today. And I believe it will be well worth our time to look at all the scripture that we're going to <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24 is what we're going to read now. 
If you're able to stand, I invite you to stand with me as we reference the reading of God's Word today. Ephesians 4, I'm reading from the New Living, verse 17. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God bring, the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him, Throw off your old sinful nature and the formal way of life which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I want to show a video clip here in just a, just a second. Um, if, you, if you've ever heard of the movie Inception by Christopher Nolan, anyone ever seen that movie, Inception? So it's a, it's a pretty good movie, I, 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 will, I will say that, but it is the movie about this idea, uh, we're gonna watch a, a clip here in a second that, that uh, describes, in the beginning of the movie, this idea of planting an idea in someone's mind. And I, I found it rather interesting because when I, when I began to look within the scriptures, what I began to discover is that there's a lot that wages war in the mind of a person. We're going to look at, in particular, three, uh, three things that try to uh, pull your mind in a certain direction. We, we look at the old nature, we look at culture, we look at Satan. And in a sense, there's one source of all three. But all three of these things, in some way, are trying to infiltrate your mind and get you to think a certain way that you shouldn't. And, and so Christopher Nolan made this movie called Inception, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. And, and, and the whole movie it is about trying to plant an idea in someone's mind and make it their own idea. And so let's just watch this uh, brief clip as they describe what Inception is. Plant the idea that 
the, the son does not want to follow in his father's footsteps. And so there's a, the whole process of, of talks about the different levels of the mind. And it, it's just rather intriguing to me if you watch the movie ever. But it was that, it, it was the, the, the concept of Christopher Nolan that we are trying to get someone to believe a thought that is not their thought. In other words, how can I get someone to believe something that isn't theirs in the first place? And so I began to look through scripture, and, and what I discovered is that this is exactly what we find when we, when we talk about the battle of the mind. Satan wants you to believe a thought that you should not believe. He wants to try to get into your mind... And he wants to try to pull you away from that to which God wants to put in. And so what we, what we describe is simply that there is a war within the mind of a person. In the battle that takes place in the mind, there is, there's three enemies. The scripture tells us there's three enemies that are trying to get a hold of what goes on in your thought process. And I think it's important that we understand all three of these because if we don't understand what the enemy is trying to do, if we don't grasp what he's trying to do in our mind, then we will never be able to have a mind of Christ. That's what we're going to land at today. How do we live with a mind of Christ? Well, first, before we do that, we have to understand the battle that is in the mind has three enemies. And those enemies are, number one, the old nature, number two, culture, and number three, Satan. Let me give you a couple scriptures to help us understand this. Number one, Romans 7, 22 and 23. Paul says, I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. So what Paul is, is, is depicting is, is a person who loves God with all their heart, but the enemy has hold of the mind. So there's a lot of Christians that live, I love Jesus, he has my heart, but the enemy has my mind. And if the enemy has your mind, then he can lead your heart. It's kind of interesting in the, in the Hebrew, when we talk about in the Old Testament, the heart and mind, they were often associated as the same thing. We'll find often that the word heart is also used for the word mind in the Old Testament. There was this understanding that whatever the heart desires is what we do. And so, if the enemy can get your mind, if the enemy can enslave your mind, keep you captive in your mind, then he can control everything else that you do. So the old nature, and we read that even in Ephesians chapter 4, that Paul tells us to, to throw off everything... Get rid of everything of this old nature. And he says, but rather allow the spirit to renew your thoughts and your attitudes, putting on something new that's created to be like God. Let him renew your thoughts. Here's what happens when the enemy comes. Paul says it. We love Jesus with all of our heart. But there's another power that is at war with your mind, trying to get your mind to constantly revert back to that old nature. That's the first battle that we have to fight. The second battle is against culture. 1 John 2.16 The world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but from the world. So not only do you have to battle the inward battle of the old nature, then you have to battle the outward battle against culture. 
a world that stands opposed and different to Jesus Christ. And so we're supposed to somehow, Paul says, be renewed by the transforming of your mind that you may understand God's perfect, pleasing will, but don't conform to the world. That was Romans 12, 2, our very first scripture we looked at. How do we, there's a battle, there's a war that takes place within this realm for your mind. Culture wants you to think one way, and Christ wants you to think another way, and we're stuck in the middle deciding which one are we going to obey. And let me just give you this. You have the ability to decide. We can't say, oh, culture made me do that. The devil made me do that. No, because you have the ability to take control of the thoughts that enter into your mind and what you do with those thoughts. And the third battle is against the enemy of simply Satan. And I want to really dive into a few scriptures here to understand this idea. The devil wants you to believe his thoughts are your thoughts. The devil wants you to believe his thoughts are your thoughts. And that's where we get this clip from Inception, is we need to understand how the enemy infiltrates your mind in order to try to get you to think his way and not think in the way that Christ wants you to think. So let's Let's open the book of 2 Corinthians, because all these are right here in Paul's second letter to the church of Corinth. And I'm just going to quickly run through these and point out what I want us to, to capture this morning about understanding the enemy of Satan when it comes to the mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. And Paul uses this phrase so that Satan may not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. So that Satan will not outsmart us. Paul seems to understand the devil isn't as stupid as some people think he is. He's clever. He's witty. And, and Paul warns us, we need to be aware of how the enemy operates. We need to be aware of the thoughts that he tries to implant in your mind. Same concept, turn over, same book, 2 Corinthians, go a couple chapters, chapter 10, verse 5. Again, Paul says, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Our weapons are not worldly weapons to knock down strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Verse 4, right before it. And Paul leads into this idea of how we need to take thoughts, we need to take things that enter into captivity and to make it obedient to Christ. And then jump over another chapter, 2 Corinthians 11, and look at verse 3. I think Paul is trying to get a message across, don't you? He says this, I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of a serpent. That somehow your mind will be led astray by just as Eve was led astray by the serpent. Somehow you too, if we're not careful, will be led astray in your mind. All three of these texts use the same word, that same word of thought. It's this Greek word noma. And this Greek word noma means mental perception. And so the stronghold, what the enemy is trying to do, the way the enemy operates is in thought. So if the enemy is going to operate in thought, and this is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, to put on the helmet of what? The helmet of salvation. 
Because he understood our battle that we are taking on is a spiritual battle, and the enemy is going after one thing. He's going after your mind. And there's a lot of Christians today who are living, who say we love Jesus, but the enemy has your mind right where he wants it so that you were never set free to live the life that Jesus wants you to live. Because why? The enemy has your mind right where he wants it. He knows if he can keep your mind right where he wants it, then he can keep you living as he wants you. There's a scripture in the Old Testament, book of Hosea, chapter 4. And the prophet told us, through God speaking, my people are destroyed from the lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed from a lack of of knowledge. Why do so many Christians live as defeated? Why do so many Christians not live a life of freedom? It's because of the lack of knowledge the enemy desires to keep from you of understanding what you are and have in Christ. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about. Everything that sets itself up against us. Listen to this. The strongholds, human reasoning to destroy false arguments, we destroy... Every proud obstacle that keeps people from what? Knowing God. If the enemy can keep you from the knowledge of God, then he can keep you from living a life that God wants you to live. The battle, the greatest battle for us is a battle of the mind. And so Paul said, don't don't let us be outsmarted. I fear that too many Christians are living lives of being outsmarted by the devil. And we live. Paul says either we make every thought, we take it captive, and we make it obedient to Christ. And so there's two things here. Either, number one... <coughs> You're going to take every thought captive, or every thought is going to take you captive. There's only two options. Either you're going to take every thought, have, and, and, and have you ever tried to stop and, and ask yourself how many thoughts go through your mind a day? There's a lot of thoughts that come through your mind a day, aren't there? A ton. It, it, and, and there's nothing that, that you can really do about it. There's not some way that you can control the thoughts that come in. What you can do is control the thought when it gets in. And that's what Paul is saying. When these thoughts come up against you, you have to take that thought captive. You, you have to grab a hold of it before it begins to get into you. You have to grab a hold of that thought, and you have to say, is this thought something I should be having? Because then I need to make it obedient to Christ. Because if you don't make it obedient to Christ, that thought's going to take you captive, and it's going to leave you enslaved to Satan. And we have to decide, which one are we going to do? Are we going to live enslaved to thoughts, or are we going to take control of thoughts and make them obedient? Because eventually, what you allow to captivate your thought life will control your life. Take every thought captive, making it obedient to to Christ. And so Satan plants a seed. He plants a seed in your mind. Here's what happens sometimes is when Satan plants a seed in your mind, over time, guess what you do? We water it. We fertilize it. We prune it. We help the thought grow. We like to give Satan all the credit for everything he does, but you know the reality Satan knows all I have to do is plant a seed because eventually they're going to make it grow. It's how you respond and take responsibility to the thought that enters your mind. Take every thought captive, making it obedient to Christ. Power comes 
Change comes when we accept the responsibility of what we do with the thoughts that enter into our mind. Let me look at another aspect of this as well. The other aspect of this is as we look at being a Christian, this is where we want to land at this morning, is that in John 10, 27, Jesus said this, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. In John 8, 47, Jesus said also, Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. He's talking to a crowd here. He's talking to people who weren't listening to the word of Jesus. Christians listen to the voice of God. And what I just said a minute ago, what does Satan not want you to do? He does not want you to listen to the voice of God. And so we have a battle that constantly is going on that Jesus says, those who are my sheep know they recognize my voice, they listen to my voice, when I speak, they obey. But Satan tries to come in and get you to think a thought that is not of Jesus and wants you to obey that thought so that you'll be disobedient to Jesus. But he does it in such a clever way that you think you're still obeying when really you're not. But that's how he works. We have to be so sensitive, and the only way that you can be sensitive to the voice of Jesus, the only way that you can be sensitive to the voice of God is when you get into the Word. Amen? Think about this with me. Everything we look at today sends a message. Everything you look at. Tonight's the Super Bowl, and there's going to be some awesome commercials, and then there's going to be some awful commercials. Every one of them is trying to get a message across. And sometimes we just kind of laugh. Ah, oh, that's funny. That's, that's a good one. And we don't even realize that Satan is using that message to infiltrate your mind. I once heard someone say this, that, that if Satan can get your mind attention for five seconds, he can keep it for five minutes. He only needs you to think about a thought for a second before you begin to flirt with it and begin to take it into how you think and how you behave. It doesn't need much because he knows you. Everything you look at, everything you pass, sends a message to your brain. And unless we are taking every message and we're making it a practice to make it obedient to Jesus Christ, should I think this? How should I think this? What should I do with this? You have to do that. But often we just let everything go. We just laugh at it, think it's funny. Ha <laughs> ha, it's a good... And before long, Satan begins to infiltrate your mind with something that only lasted a couple seconds. Billboards, political ads, products, sports, everything has a message that it tries to express. But you know who also is trying to get a message across in your life is Jesus Christ. And if you're not in the Word of God, how are you going to get His message across? We talk about spiritual transformation. We talk about what does it mean to change habits. If we're not getting our minds transformed to think in the way that Jesus wants us to think, we'll never get into the change of habit that we desire to see. And Satan also is battling for your mind. Jesus is battling for your mind. Listen to Romans chapter 8. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always, say always, always. hostile to God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. 
Your old nature will never obey what God wants you to do. But guess what? He's always going to be right behind you trying to say, hey, come on back. There's always an Egypt in everyone's life. It doesn't just go away. Christ wants you to live in the new life. He wants you to live in the new nature that he has given you. You have to identify that nature and decide this is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. This is who Christ has called me to be. He has told me to leave that old nature and to step and to live in the new. Take responsibility to live in what Christ has called you to live. How do we do this? So I want to just look at a couple scriptures to really make this applicable this morning. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Let's look at that one first, and then we'll look over Philippians for a second one. I believe this is this is powerful stuff. You can't be influenced by that to which you don't know. And so if we want to use the word, if we want God to help us, then we have to have the word hidden in your heart. So that when the temptation of the enemy comes, when he comes into your life, the tension, if he is met with the word of God that's been planted in your heart. We can't draw forth something that's not there. I try to get this across to people all the time, but it never seems to occur. If you get into the Word every day, guess what? It is going to plant in your heart. It's going to be received. It's living and active. It's going to, it's, it's going to start living inside of you. It's going to start operating inside of you. And when the enemy comes to tempt you in something, he's going to meet the Word of God. But here's the problem is that too many American Christians, we starve ourselves of the Word. It, it's, it, it's incredible. <coughs> when I read news from... Nazarene missionaries all across the world of how desperate people are for the Word of God. And we have <coughs> access to it here, but we don't put it in us. But then we text the pastor, Pastor, I need a good word today. I'm like, get in your own word. <laughs> My word's for me today. Get in your own word and find your own word today. <laughs> Sorry if I said that to you. <laughs> Any one of you got that, I don't know. But if you did, please do come back. We love you. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm serious. Get into your own word. It's like I'm supposed to know what you need. No, I don't. <laughs> he knows what you need. He knows the battle that's coming. He's the one that provides the way out of temptation, not me. If you get into the word, the temptation meets the word of God in you, and you're able to fight. What's your sword? Ephesians 6. The word of God. And we wonder why we're getting defeated. Because Hosea said the lack of knowledge of him. We don't know him. We don't know him. Look at Colossians 3.2. It says this. Colossians 3.1. I'll enter it. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ. Did you get that? Raised to what? New life. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died in, in, to this life and your real life is now hidden with Christ. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Position your mind to think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Amen. What does culture want you to think about? The things of earth. What does Satan want you to think about? The things of earth. What is your old nature? The things of earth. They gratify. They want you to think about it all the time. 
Paul says you need to position your mind to think about things of heaven. Every day, every thought, think about the things of Christ. What does that look like? Well, Paul describes it to us in his book, my second scripture, Philippians chapter 4. And so he says this, verses 7 and 8. And I'm telling you what, I have preached this so many times and I've read this so many times and if we could just simply get this into our minds, we could live transformed. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. As you live in Jesus, he will guard your heart. He will guard your mind. If you live in Christ Jesus, what does it mean to live in Christ Jesus? What does it mean to have your mind to live in Christ Jesus? Well, thank you, Paul, that you explained it to me because it's very helpful. He says this, and so finally, picture thoughts. Here it is. How do I live with the mind in Christ? It's not too complicated. Here's how you do it. Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise and keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me. Then the God of peace will be with you. Have you ever heard someone say, I just need a peace of mind? Well, I can tell you how to get it. <laughs> Quit infiltrating your mind with thoughts that shouldn't be there. Think about things that are what? True. What does the enemy want you to think about? Lies. Negativity dishonest, deception, so anything that, that comes into your life. Don't sit there and think about it. Fill your mind with the truth. It says what's honest. Thoughts that come into your mind that are secretive or manipulative. begin to control because you know as a man begins to think so he does our lives begin to get shaped by the thoughts that enter your mind and so when you begin to think on dishonest thoughts they begin to slowly turn your life into dishonesty mm -hmm. listen to what is honest Paul says, listen to what is pure. What's the opposite of purity? Things that are sinful, things that are perverted, things that are unclean, things that are filthy. I got convicted of this as growing up. I used to listen to music that was unclean, that was filthy, that was perverted. And I filled my mind with that. And I'll tell you, it shaped who I was. And there came a point in my life when one day the Holy Spirit said, you want to change? Yeah, change. Think about what you're listening to. And you know the funny thing is, is, is that I had some guys I used to work out with in the gym back when we lived in Illinois. Every morning we'd work out and, 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 and they would just throw in whatever music, you know, and sometimes you wouldn't really be able to hear what they were saying. But you know, even when you were around it, subconsciously you're thinking about what's being said and we don't imagine oh Satan doesn't work in that oh yeah he does he begins to shape your life by what you don't think you're hearing I would go into the gym and, and these people would be listening to this music and I'm just like is that really what you want to fill your mind with the very first thing in the morning no wonder why all you do is complain about your day and I got convicted Quit listening to the music, and before long, I began to feel healthy mentally. 
that shapes you, things that are unclean, things that are filthy. Think on things that are pure. And so I tell people, I listen to Christian music, and they're like, what? I'm like, there's some pretty good Christian music out there. They, you just got to get find it and listen to it. There's a little bit of everything for anybody. And so don't say, I can't listen to Christian because it's not hard rock or it's not whatever. My, man, they have it for everything out there. You can find it. God's doing some cool things. What's just? The enemy wants you to feel, to live in a state of victimized or self-pity. Always living in self-comparison, self-righteousness. Paul says, whoever is lovely. The enemy wants you to think things of self-hatred and hardness. Things that are of good report. Here's a tough one, folks. The enemy wants you to what? Listen to criticism? Wants you to listen to profanity, gossip, slander? Mm-hmm. That's a tough one. The devil loves it when church people gossip. When they slander people outside of the church. Anger, profanity. The enemy has such a ground in that. That we like, some, somehow we crave listening to it. We love to get the news about things. Paul says, don't think on those things. Because before long, someone else's anger becomes your anger. Someone else's problem becomes your problem. Someone else's dislike becomes your dislike. Their view of something becomes your view of that person. And the enemy slowly begins to <coughs> take control of your mind and not think on things that are good. Report. Things that are virtuous. Things of praise. Outlook determines your outcome. And so if you want to know, how do I take control of my mind? How do I position it? If you want to change habits in your life, you, you have to change the way you think. And so Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, fix your thoughts has become kind of a uh, filter for me. When things enter into the mind. When you engage with people. Because that same word that we looked at, those thoughts of the enemy. Philippians 4, 7. Noma. I thought this was pretty neat. The same thing, the same way. That Paul identifies in 2 Corinthians, the same word we use in all those scriptures, the same word you use of what the enemy is trying to do to you. The word noma is the same word that Paul uses in Philippians 4, 7. And his peace will guard your heart and noma as you live in Christ Jesus. So what's the way to overcome the enemy's schemes? How do we overcome the way the enemy works? It's to live in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and when you live in Christ Jesus, he will guard your heart and your mind. How about that enemy? Take that, Satan, when you come into my mind. Jesus is standing right there. And he says, get back. Get back. But are you living in Christ? We're going to sing a song this morning as we close that speaks about the call to live holiness, to live righteousness, to live faithfulness. This is what I long for. So take my life and mold it. Take my mind and transform it to your help. And so as we just sing this song this morning, I'm just going to give a prayer.
My prayer is simply this, this morning, the Holy Spirit, as we close and as the word's been given and, and as we sing this song, we're focusing just specifically on our mind this morning. Holy Spirit, come and begin to draw our mind to you. Help us to begin to put into practice that to which we receive. Help us to put into these, in a sense, these barriers and filters of what it means to live in Christ, that when the messages all around us, the thoughts that come into our mind, that we will take those thoughts captive, that we'll be aware of what the enemy is trying to do in the midst of that, that we'll be spiritually sensitive to know how do I take this thought? What does it mean to make it obedient to you? We want to be able to be a church, a body of Christ, a community of believers that have minds fixed on heavenly things, not earthly things. We want to take back the battle that the enemy is winning in the battle of the mind. And so, Spirit, come this morning and do a work of sanctification within our minds. Let's stand together and let's make this our prayer for song.